The next important outcome of the census is the sex ratio. Sex ratio is the number of females per thousand males in the population of the country. In other words, it shows the male and female population in the country. Students, how do you think the sex ratio is an important indicator? The sex ratio is an important social indicator which brings out the extent of quality between males and females in a country. From this graph, we can see the sex ratio between 1951 and 2011. The number of females per thousand males in 1951 was 946, while the number fell to 940 in 2011. We can see that the number of females has continuously been lower than that of the men. Students, the low number indicates discrimination in the society. As we see, many women still do not get equal opportunities for education and development. The discrimination can be seen even in the areas of nutrition, child care and health. According to medical research, if the girls are given the similar circumstances for living as given to the boys, the girl children survive much better than the boys. From this, we can understand that had there been no discrimination, the number of girls would be higher or equal to the number of boys. The Census of India also brings out the information that 103 female babies are born against 100 male babies. But we see that the more number of female babies die than the male babies. Specifically in the age group of 0 to 5 years, the survival rate of the girl child is very low. Students, what do you think is the reason for this? Yes, discrimination with regard to care and nutrition of the girl child is one of the main reasons for this condition. Moreover, if we take a comparative look as countries or societies where there is equality for women, the sex ratios are different. The regions with unequal gender relations or discrimination point unequal sex ratios in the particular countries. This table shows us the sex ratios of various states in India compared with USA. While the sex ratio is 870 in Haryana, 880 in Punjab, 970 in AP and 1040 in Kerala, the number of females per thousand males is 1050. From the table we can see that Kerala has a positive sex ratio when compared to other states in India. One of the striking aspects of gender bias is the partiality that is shown to the boys. As a result of this, the mortality rates of girls are high when compared to the boys. The health and nutrition of the girl children is ignored as a result of which they become prone to diseases. In addition to this, there is the case of female infanticide. The child is aborted even before the child is born in many of the cases. With some of the parents preferring boys over girls and viewing girl child as a burden, they tend to get the female child aborted before the birth. Not just this, the research shows that priority in health continues for male adults as a result of which the mortality rates tend to be high for adult women. Students, in such kind of circumstances, education can be a guiding light to do away with the discrimination. Women's education especially can be a strong factor in reducing the discrimination. Evidences show that literacy of women is an enabling factor for reducing child mortality and neglect of health of girl child. Students, what do you think about the opportunities that are available to the girls, especially in comparison to the boys? Do you think they get equal opportunities like the boys? As we all know, 
literacy or the level of education is an important indicator of socio-economic development in a country. As given by the census of 2011, a literate is a person aged 7 years and above who can read and write in any language. In 1947, during the time of independence, the literacy rate of the country was 12%. In 2001, it grew to 64.84%. Census 2011 records a literacy rate of 74.04%. The census 2011, however, points out a striking disparity in the literacy rates of men and women. While the literacy rate of men stood at 92.14%, the literacy rate of women stood at 65.46%. Students, we have seen that the working population is the people aged between 15 to 59 years. These people may work the whole year or during various parts depending on the work availability. Students, another interesting aspect here is that the unpaid work of the homemakers does not feature in any of this. In this table, we can see the distribution of workers according to census 2011. Farmers who farm and supervise the lands they own or rent fall under cultivators category. Agricultural laborers are the ones who work on somebody else's farm for wages which may be in kind or in cash. Workers with manufacturing or repairing setups at home such as beady workers, potters, weavers, toy makers and so on constitute the workers in household industries. Other workers mean the individuals who are working in factories, casual labor, etc. While cultivators constituted 25%, agricultural laborers were 30%. Students, as we all know, population is dynamic. In other words, the numbers of population is changing every second the distribution, composition as well. Students, how do you think this happens? Yes, this happens as a result of the births, the deaths and migrations. When it comes to the change in the size of the population, it is the difference in the number of inhabitants of a country or a region during a specific period, maybe during the last 10 years. These changes are shown in two ways. 1 as absolute numbers and 2 as percentage change. The absolute numbers that get added every decade point out the extent of increase. In other words, population change in absolute numbers is equal to population at later date minus the population at earlier date. If the resulting number is positive, there is an increase in the population. In case there is a negative result, it means the population has decreased. Students, now let us see how population change in a place is calculated. In other words, population change in a place is equal to the number of deaths plus number of in-migrants minus number of deaths plus number of out-migrants. Migrants, as we all know, are the people who move from one place to the other in search of work. 14. In case the population change in a place is a negative number, it simply means that it has decreased by that number. Students, let us assume there is no migration at all. Then what happens? In case there is no migration, the population change can be calculated by taking the birth rate and the death. Birth rate is the number of live births per thousand persons in a year. For example, the birth rate of our country was 29 in 1992. This means that 29 live births took place for every thousand people living in the country. Death rate is the number of deaths per thousand persons in a year. 
the death rate of our country was 10 in 1992. It means that 10 deaths took place for every thousand persons in that year. So the population change can be calculated by subtracting the birth rate from the death rate which gives us 29 minus 10 which equals to 19. This means for every thousand people, 19 people were added during that particular year. The population change that we calculated can be expressed in percentage as 1.9% which translates as population growth rate of 1.9% for 1992. Students, the rate of increase of the population is very important. The rate of population is given as percent per annum or the annual growth rate. For example, 3% per annum simply means that there is an increase of 3 persons for every 100 persons in that year. Now that we have seen the various calculations of birth rates, let us find out the causes for the growth of the population in that country. This graph points out the population of India between 1901 and 2011. We can see that there is a sharp decline in the death rates. Later, the developments in medicines like vaccines and antibiotics led to improvements in health care. As a result of all these advancements, the death rates came down when compared to the year 1900. The high birth rates along with the decreased death rate led to higher rates of population in the country. We can see that the birth rates also began to come down which resulted in a decline in the rate of growth of population in the country. This table shows the magnitude and rate of India's population growth. It is an exercise for you to fill in the missing numbers in the absolute increase in the annual growth column. From this table we can see that highest of 2.22% rate is recorded in 1981. Students, what do you understand from this? The graph clearly points out the percentage over each decade of population. The total fertility rate which is the number of children that is likely to be born to a woman if she were to lie to the end of her childbearing years and bear children in accordance with the current pattern is an important factor in understanding the trend of population. A low fertility rate points out that the couples are deciding to have fewer children. This decision may be an outcome of individual as well as family decisions. While the fertility rate of India was more than 5.6 in India in 1960, it points out that on an average every woman was likely to have 4 or 5 children. It is the family that decides the number of children they want to have based on their economic conditions, security opportunities for the children and other social norms. But students, the conditions gradually began to change. Let's see how. The fertility rate in India currently stands at 2.7, which means on an average each woman is likely to have three or four children. The fertility rate of Andhra Pradesh is 1.9. Another important element that contributes to change in population is migration. Although internal migration may not change the numbers of population, it is an influencing factor in the distribution of population in the nation. The migration is an important factor that changes the composition and distribution of the population in a country. Students, we often hear people talking big about the growth of population with a view that there are few resources and too many people using those resources. But what should be kept in mind is that is the families that decide the number of children they want to have depending on various factors. Moreover, 
We also see that the families with large number of children are poorer and are not able to afford the basic necessities of life too. One can get a better idea of the distribution of population by understanding the aspect of population density. Population density is the number of persons per unit area. Our country is one of the most densely populated in the world. The population of India stood at 382 persons per square kilometer in 2011. While the highest density is 1,102 persons per square kilometer in Bihar, the lowest of 17 persons per square kilometer is seen in Arunachal Pradesh. The states of Assam and other peninsular states have moderate population density. This is because of the hilly terrain, moderate to low rainfall, shallow to less fertile soils of the region. From this, we can understand that the plains facilitate high density of population. The northern plains and Kerala in our country have high to very high density of population because of the flat plains and the fertile soils. Students, here is an exercise for you. Find out the states in the northern plains with high population densities. But students, how do you think there is so much variation in the population. We have to know, understand the history, terrain and climatic conditions of the region to know about the variations in the density of population. Students, in this map we can see the population density of India at the district level. We can see that some areas have density of 1 to 4 persons per square kilometer, some areas 250 to 999 and highly dense areas with more than 1000 persons per square kilometer. Students, here is an exercise for you for the next class. On a district map of Andhra Pradesh, mark the districts. Also, try finding out the areas with high density and low density of population. Students, so these are the various aspects of population. Hope you have understood them clearly and also the importance of population for a country. Let us explore more about people in the next class.